sponsored by Surfshark. The Pokémon region of Kanto, based on the actual region of Kanto in Japan, defined the Pokémon franchise ever since its first appearance in Red and Blue. It has subsequently been remade in Gold and Silver, then Fire Red and Leaf Green, Hard Gold and Soul Silver, and one final time in Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. But for all its incarnations, there is one area of Kanto that only existed once, was exclusive to the third generation and never remade, the Civi Islands. Why is that? Well, what is the goal of the Gen 3 remakes? Enjoy the original games, along with all the improvements from Ruby and Sapphire. But including every edition since Red and Blue would change the remakes into different games. The solution? Create an experience as faithful as possible to the source material and add an exclusive area specifically made to bridge the gap between Gen 1 and Gen 3. This area would act as a greatest hits of Pokémon, featuring content introduced in Gen 2 and 3. So how about we explore every nook and cranny of this unique area, understand the purpose of each edition, and learn about the secrets of the Savy Islands. Before we travel though, we need to be prepared. Our dream team to fight opposing trainers and Surfshark, this video sponsor, to protect our data. In both cases, sharks are the way to go. What's the point of preventing Team Rocket from stealing Pokémon if we don't prevent them from stealing our personal data using a VPN? In real life, hackers are not so hilariously incompetent. And Surfshark makes sure you are safe on the internet by encrypting your personal data. Especially useful when using public Wi-Fi. Also, if you know anything about Pokémon, you know how much content is only accessible in specific areas of the world. By using a VPN, you can virtually move anywhere. Surfshark has over 3,000 servers and more than 100 countries to choose from, so you will never miss out on region-locked content. If you have decided you need sharks in your life and a VPN, you can use the code Lyra or use the referral link in the video description for an extra three months off your subscription you'll get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so no reason not to give it a try. Thank you for using my referral code and for Surfshark for sponsoring this video. The Civi Island questline starts in Cinnabar Island, right after defeating Blaine. Or not. Upon exiting the gym, we run into Bill, the man behind the Pokémon storage system, who invites us to his friend's island an offer we can refuse. To keep Fire Red and Leaf Green as close to the original games as possible, we can completely bypass the Civi Islands by simply saying no. We still have to meet back with Bill in Cinnabar's Pokémon Center to unlock the post-Elite 4 content, but giving us the choice is a neat touch. Once we accept to join Bill, we are transported to the new area, where we meet his friend, Celio, currently working on a machine that would allow communication with other regions. The first Savy Island we arrive at is called One Island. Be prepared for some very literal naming. The Savy name itself is a combination of the word seven and its Roman numeral, for the seven main islands we can sail to. The only point of interest in this town is the Pokemon Network Center and its supercomputer. South of the dock is Treasure Beach. What makes this place special is the presence of infinite item spots, a feature specific to Fire Red and Leaf Green. Here's how it works. Certain areas have three groups of items tied to a probability to be chosen. Group A has 60% chance, Group B has 30% chance, and Group C has 10% chance to be selected. Each item has its own specific spot but only spawns if its group is chosen. This is refreshed every 1500 steps, where the game chooses a new group and spawns the corresponding items, replacing the previous ones even if they haven't been picked up. Groups B and C usually give out the best items. This mechanic is mostly used in the Savy Islands, but a few Kanto areas have infinite item spots, 
such as both Underground Paths, Routes 20 and 21, and most importantly, Mount Moon, where we can obtain the useful tiny and big mushrooms, which we'll get to later. In the case of Treasure Beach, we will always get two Ultra Balls and can find an assortment of cell items, such as pearls, stardust, and star pieces, who washed up on shore. To the east of one island is Kindle Road, a path going north where we encounter trainers, breakable rocks, and the Amber Spa. The hot springs at the spa heal our team, and an old man gives us the HM Rock Smash. This move did not exist in Gen 1, and is the reason why we only encounter breakable rocks in areas within or after the Savy Islands, except for Rock Tunnel. At the end of Kindle Road, we find Mount Amber, the new home of the legendary bird Moltres, which was originally located in Victory Road. Next up, Two Island, where we are given the task to deliver a meteorite. Note that during our first visit to the Savy Islands, we cannot return to Kanto until the side quest is finished and no going back using Surf. In fact, we cannot swim or fish around two islands, as the current is too strong. This is an interesting alternative to the way Pokemon usually restricts water movement. Putting rocks everywhere. Two Island features numerous points of interest. First, a market stall with an evolving stock, although very limited for now. Second, the move reminder. Unlike other core games, the NPC does not ask for the usual heart scale, as those were added in Gen 3 along with Love Disk. Instead, we need either two tiny mushrooms or one big mushroom held by the Gen 1 Pokemon Paras and Parasect, or found in the newly introduced infinite item spawns in Mount Moon. Next, the joyful game corner where we need to deliver the meteorite but the owner won't hear anything until his lost daughter is back. Her name? Lostel. Remember, names are literal here. Finally, north of Two Island, in the picturesque Cape Brink, we can teach our starter a new Gen 3 move if it is fully evolved and has maximum friendship. Frenzy Plant for Venusaur, Blast Burn for Charizard, and Hydro Cannon for Blastoise. Next is Three Island. Right outside the dock, we find a tiny cave with a man prospecting for gold. In the town proper are a gang of bikers looking for trouble. Nothing a young kid can't handle. West of town, we cross Bond Bridge to get to Berry Forest. This place is full of easily noticeable infinite berries spots, replacing berry trees. This is because Fire Red and Leaf Green don't keep track of time making trees impossible to implement, and is why infinite spots refresh every 1500 steps, as other Pokemon games usually rely on daily events instead. At the end of the Berry Forest, we find Lostel, who gets attacked by a Hypno. This creepy encounter is consistent with Hypno's Fire Red Pokedex entry, which mentions an incident in which it took away a child it hypnotized. Once the lost girl is brought back to her father and the meteorite delivered, Two Islands' stall is updated with better stock, and the joyful game corner opens, allowing Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald players to enjoy two wireless minigames, Pokemon Jump and Dodrio Berry Picking. We can then go back to the Pokemon Network Center on one island and finish our first Savy Islands visit back to Cinnabar Island, where we can continue our Kanto journey. We are free to come back to the islands at any time from the Vermilion City Harbor, but nothing more will happen until we unlock the post Elite 4 content. And that's where things get dicey. One aspect I have not mentioned is how different the Savy Islands questline feels from the rest of the game. The original Pokemon games are extremely open, we are free to explore the world however we want, even if it means beating gyms out of order or missing important items, like the XP share or the HM Flash. But as soon as we enter the Civi Islands, we have to follow the rigid path set for us, which includes several cutscenes, and cannot leave until finished. And this jarring difference in design from Gen 1 to 3 becomes clearer upon defeating the Elite Four. 
Becoming the Kanto Champion ordinarily opens Cerulean Cave, but in Fire Red and Leaf Green, we only gain access to it after completing both Savy Island visits, which requires obtaining the National Pokedex, meaning we have to own 60 Pokémon. Taking into account version exclusives, choices and evolutions, it is close to half the Pokémon available. And our task is made harder by the fact that the place designed to help us catch up with Pokédex completion, Cerulean Cave, is inaccessible. It gets somehow worse, as the game never tells us the national decks being necessary. The only hint we get is that we need to have made a great achievement. Whatever that means. It is very strange how the Gen 1 games had a completely optional incentive to catch Pokémon with the Professor Oak rewards, which Gen 3 expanded and rendered mandatory and harder to achieve. Once we go back to Professor Oak's lab with 60 Pokémon owned, both ours and Blue's Pokédex get upgraded. Our rival then decides to go to one island. We do the same and meet up with Celio once more, helping him improve his network to allow trading between regions. The first step is to go back to Mount Amber and beat up the two rocket goons guarding an additional cave. Inside it, we find inscriptions in Bry. If you ignore what Bry is, Game Freak has added in every Gen 3 game's instruction manual a small text explaining it, as well as a translation of the basic alphabet. In fact, this alphabet is repeated in game first, before a second longer inscription in the floor below. This writing system was also used in Ruby and Sapphire to find the legendary titans, so it is fitting we find it once more next to the ruby key item. We bring it to Celio, who needs the sapphire to finish his work. To help us locate it, we are given the Rainbow Pass, allowing us to explore the rest of the islands. We can stop by two islands to notice the stall stock now includes Moo Moo Milk, an item introduced in Gen 2 with Miltank, which explains why it required the national decks. And on three islands, the cave is fully dug out, giving us access to a small patch of grass exclusively containing Dunsparce, the only other place to obtain this Pokémon in Gen 3 being Pokémon Colosseum. We use the Rainbow Pass to sail to four islands, and with the National Pokédex unlocked, the game can open the floodgates with Gen 2 and 3 features and items. First, several themes used are remakes of music from Gold and Silver, in the style of the Game Boy Advance games. We also find the Pokémon Daycare, which, contrary to the Gen 1 version on Route 5, allows for two Pokémon at once, unlocking breeding in Fire Red and Leaf Green. Next, we have the house of the Elite Four member, Lorelei, and she is quite the Pokémon doll aficionado. Every 25 times we enter the Hall of Fame, a new doll is added to her collection, starting with 6 and ending with 14 after 200 entries. To keep track of our victories, we can go to the Braggart's house, who gives us trainer card stickers. The color of the sticker is dependent on our progress in one of three categories. Number of Hall of Fames entered, Pokémon eggs hatched, and Link multi-battles won. Finally, to the northeast is Icefall Cave, a small area containing the Gen 2 held item Never Melt Ice and the HM Waterfall, which only existed as a combat move in Gen 1. The only required use of this HM in all of Fire Red and Leaf Green is in this very cave, to access the cove, where we find Lorelei beating up some rocket goons. This looks like fun, let's join in! The cove is also the only area in Gen 3 where we can encounter a wild Lapras, with a 1% encounter chance, which could be interesting if we weren't just given one in Silphco during the story. The trend of giving the player all the items and features missing in Gen 1 continues with Five Island. To the east of the very small settlement we arrive at is the Five Isle Meadow, where is located the Rocket Warehouse. We only have one of the two passwords required to enter, so we'll come back later. 
east is a small island full of bird trainers, and by going south from there, we arrive at Memorial Island. In front of the memorial itself is a mourning trainer, who explains the monument commemorates Tectonix the Onyx. If we put a lemonade on the memorial, Tectonix's favorite drink, its trainer thanks us with TM42. I personally love this place. It is a fantastic example of environmental storytelling. Should we read into TM42's move being facade? Or maybe its Japanese name, bravado? What about the metal coat we pick up southwest of the monument? Is it a random item, a memento, or was it left there by the morning trainer? who was originally planning on evolving his companion. This area is simple, yet touching. Going back to Five Island, swimming north, we pass through the Water Labyrinth. Don't let the name of this place fool you. It is very small and quick to navigate to its center island, where an old man gives us a Togepi egg if our first Pokemon has high friendship. North again is Resort Gorgeous which is an empty small house. Its owner is currently lost in the Lost Cave to the east. This cave acts similarly to the Lost Woods in The Legend of Zelda. One wrong choice and we are sent back to the entrance. Thankfully, the number of rocks present in each room indicate the clock position of the correct path. 3, 6, 9 or 12. If we go the opposite direction in every other room, we can find various held items, notably both newly introduced sea and lax incenses. At the end of the cave, we meet the owner of Resort Gorgeous, the self-centered Selfie. She is cartoonishly mean, and once brought back to Resort Gorgeous, asks to see one of the Pokemon in our Pokedex changing her mind every 250 steps. If we show her the right Pokemon, she begrudgingly reward us with either a luxury ball, a sell item, or a rare candy. On Six Island, we are greeted by Blue, who's had enough of the Civi Islands. Well, we haven't, so let's see what this place has to offer. To the east, we have the Branching Water Path. The South Path leads to Ruin Valley along with the only sunstone in Fire Red and Leaf Green, an item added in Gen 2 alongside Blossom and Sunflora. At the end of this spiraling path is the Dotted Hole, the second area to feature Bry. The text here tells us to use Cut to open the cave, and then which hole to jump into. At the very bottom, we have a message referencing the fact we can unlock trading with Hoenn if we reunite both Ruby and Sapphire key items, alongside said Sapphire. Unfortunately, the gemstone is immediately stolen by a rocket scientist, Gideon. We could go back to the rocket warehouse, as he gives us the second password, but we still have a few places to explore first. In the northern part of the water path lives a girl looking for the ultimate horn. She will measure any Heracross we show her, looking for the biggest one, and reward us with a nest ball every time we beat the current record. Conveniently, the nearby pattern bush is full of Heracross. This forest has trainers and players alike wondering about its grass pattern. What do you see? I just see bad area design. We keep going through the scenic green path and swim north until we arrive at the intriguing Altering Cave. In this mysterious and unique area, we encounter... Zubat. And just Zubat. 100% of the time. The Altering Cave also exists on Route 103 in Emerald, and unlocks after defeating the Elite Four. It also features nothing but Zubat. What is going on here? Well, the idea was to add Pokemon to the cave using the mystery gift system through official events. Both the message that would appear and the encounter table exist in Fire Red, Leaf Green and Emerald, but are never used. Interestingly, all the Pokemon featured are from Gen 2. That's the main problem with Pokemon events. 
If they are over or never released, it is content present in the game, but inaccessible. I made an entire video on the subject if you are curious for more. Funnily enough, the fact we cannot encounter any of the planned Pokémon makes the berry juice held by Wild Chuckle unobtainable in all of Gen 3. Literally unplayable. The final island we have access to, Seven Island, also features inaccessible content. This blocked off door leads to unique trainer encounters unlocked using the mystery gift only in Japan. The trainer tower to the north is Fire Red and Leaf Green's version of the Battle Tower, with a focus on speedy challenge completion. There are four modes of play, each rewarding with a different evolution held item. South of Seven Island is the Savolt Canyon. Other than being the only place to catch Gen 2's Larvitar in the GBA games, we pick up a King's Rock, do the Chansey Dance with a Chansey next to the Chansey-specific item Lucky Punch, and enter the Tanobi Key, a cave with a puzzle unlocking the true potential of the Tanobi Ruins located south. That true potential is the power of a known. The Tanobi Ruins are composed of seven Tanobi Chambers. Each one has a unique name, color, and, after completing the Tanobi Key, set of unknown. The chamber names are a mix of its number and the plant. Munian, Leaptu, Weepth, Dilford, Scuffib, Rexy, and Viapoa. Viapois? Viapois. Something. Finally, Gen 3 introduces two new unknown forms the question mark and the exclamation point. Now that our exploration is done, we can go back to the Rocket Warehouse, located on Five Island, to get our Sapphire back. After a puzzle like the one in the Rocket Hideout, we convince Team Rocket to leave the Sibi Islands. It is then revealed the goons we have encountered here are the ones responsible for the events happening in Pokémon Gold and Silver. We finally deliver the second gemstone to Celio, and can now connect our Gen 1 remake to every other Gen 3 game, as all the features we should have access to are now accessible. The stall on 2 Island updates one final time, with the Hoenn Lava Cookie, the Repeat Ball, and the Timer Ball. In fact, we can obtain almost every Gen 3 ball now, thanks to Infinite Item Spots, Selfie, the Ultimate Horn Girl, and its netball equivalent with the Super Rod NPC on Route 12, who asks us to bring him Big Magikarp. Only the Premier and Dive Balls remain exclusive to Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. But there are still two secret Civi Islands we have not explored yet. Naval Rock, located between four and five islands, accessible using the Mystic Ticket, and Birth Island, between six and seven islands using the Aurora Ticket. The tickets were only obtainable through Mystery Gift events, specific to Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald, and the islands don't show up on the map until we visit them, or not at all in the case of Emerald. Naval Rock is home to both Lugia and Ho-Oh, and we can pick up the Sacred Ash with the Item Finder after encountering the latter. Birth Island is where Deoxys makes its appearance once we solve the mystery of its triangular rock. Both extra islands are really cool, and I wish they weren't event exclusives. But if you know where to look for, you can find ways to trigger these events even today. And there we are, all the Sivi Islands explored and the questline completed. We finally unlock Cerulean Cave, where Mewtwo awaits us. Now we understand why these islands were absent from subsequent renditions of Kanto. Hard Gold and Soul Silver introduced all the Gen 3 and 4 changes within the story. And Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee purposefully only included Gen 1 content. It is a bummer the Sivi Islands were lost to time, as they feature some of the best parts of Gen 3. They also would have gained from being easier to access as the National Pokédex requirement is rough, but are a fantastic reward 
for those who are determined. So next time you set foot in Kanto, make sure you explore the seas and don't miss the Sivi Islands. They are well worth the detour. I hope you enjoyed this excursion at sea. Special thanks to every patron supporting the channel, especially Chris Lunders, The Only Venom, Lucas Maximilian Lur, Jonas C, Our Cat's Store, and Kelzini. Additional extra thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Make sure to use the referral link for all your VPN needs. Thank you very much for your time, and I wish you a wonderful day.